everyone and welcome to Energy Explored. This podcast covers the challenges of achieving a carbon neutral global economy, cutting emissions of gases and pollutants and setting up new energy systems. Join Reed Smith lawyers and guest speakers as they shed light on the most important trends in emissions control and new fuels. Tune in as we follow the ever evolving journey through the transition of energy. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back to Energy Explored, uh, your podcast on energy issues. I'm uh, Yves Melin, partner in the Brussels office of Reed Smith, specializing in international trade and customs. Today, I'm discussing with my partner in Munich, Daya Apetzdraya, about the supply chain due diligence schemes that we see increasingly being adopted in Europe, and uh, more specifically, two of them, one German and the other European. And uh, Daya, obviously from Munich, is going to discuss the, the German Act. While from Brussels, I will be presenting briefly the outlines of uh, the two new texts that the EU is adopting. Great. Thank you, Yves. So, Daya, can you please give us a quick overview of the German supply chain due diligence, which entered into force uh, recently for, for Germany? Yes, for sure. Thank you, Yves, and a warm welcome also from my end. The German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act came into force on 1st of January this year, so 2023. And for affected companies, this means a multitude of effects on the company's structure. First, the risk management, the procurement processes and supplier contracts, as well as the need for new documentation and reporting obligations. And, of course, new challenges for legal departments. So maybe to give you a quick overview of what is requested from companies in Germany. It really means that you have or should start as a company with a risk analysis and a risk management, meaning that you have to identify human rights risks and environmental risks in your company and along your supply chain. You should be minimizing risks or ending or preventing violations. And one important thing is you need somebody being responsible for the risk management internally, i.e. you need a human rights officer. You don't have to call him human rights officer, but it needs to be a person being responsible. And for the prevention, you should have a policy statement and a procurement strategy, as well as training. And you should have contract clauses in your supply chain requesting your contracting parties to also adhere to prevent or stop violations regarding to human rights or environmental risks. What kind of remedies? Can you have, you should definitely end if you notice a violation. And if there is a violation of a direct supplier, you should end that violation or develop a strategy to terminate it. The ultimate ratio is really terminating a relationship, but this is really ultimate ratio. You also need to build, or probably many companies already have a complaint procedure, and you need to have this now also with regard to enable employees and also third parties to have access to the complaints procedure and to complain about human rights risks and environmental risks. Finally, you should document and report all the risk management you have in place and the violations you explore, and you have to keep those documents in place for seven years and need to make it public annually. Thank you, Diana. That's very interesting. Does the German Act apply to all companies or are there uh, certain thresholds that uh, companies should be aware of? So there are two different thresholds. So now, since the 1st of January, companies, regardless of the legal form, are affected, which have their registered office in Germany and 3,000 employees. So it's only applying to large companies. When calculating the number of employees, um, the following employees are included. It's temporary workers with a duration of assignment of more than six months. Also employees working abroad 
and employees of group companies at a German group parent company if this is the ultimate group company. As of 1st of January 2024, the threshold will be 1,000 employees, so covering many more companies than it does now. Maybe you should keep in mind that the act is also applicable to foreign companies, provided that the German parent company has a determining influence, that they are direct suppliers of a German company that is in the scope of the law, and if they have a German branch that has 3,000 employees already. So it's not only applicable to German companies, but also foreign companies, as just stated. And if you're a direct supplier of a bigger company, so you as a company are below the threshold at the moment, but you have contracts with companies who already fall under the threshold of 3,000 companies, uh, 3,000 employees. That company can request you to also adhere to the new German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act in their contract courses. Okay, th- those thresholds are very interesting, Daya. Uh, are there other questions or concerns that are uh, worrying the, the companies and clients contacting you today, Daya? So, actually, in the last few weeks, we have been approached by a number of clients who are either already within the threshold of 3,000 employees or only have, like, employees between or more than a thousand so that the act only applies to them as of first January next year. So maybe for those who are already falling under the act, that many companies are still struggling with determining who should be responsible within the company to implement the requirements laid down by the new act. So they have not the responsible person yet. They haven't made a risk analysis within their supply chain, which company they work with could be from an industry perspective or from a country's perspective or a local location be or constitute a high risk that they should monitor them and should determine whether they should really continue working with them, and if so, in which capacity, and whether they should train them, and how they should um, move forward in this regard. And in particular, as we are lawyers, we are asked how those companies should impose the new stipulations laid down by the Act to their suppliers, so they need to amend their contracts, they probably need to modify their code of conduct for their suppliers, and that's the questions we have been approached with recently. For those companies not falling under the act yet, they are either approached by bigger companies who ask them to accept new contract clauses to adhere to the act, or they try to prepare for the act come applying to them as of next year. So they are starting to build a structure around the risk analysis and risk management and the compliance procedure to be ready as of next year. Okay, many thanks, Leah. That's most interesting. So Eve, could you give an overview of the situation from a EU perspective, so a broader perspective. What will the EU bring to what Germany already has? Of course, Diane. Actually, a lot of what you explained sounds very familiar to me because the philosophy of the EU directive is is not far away from what the the German Act provides. First, a bit of an introduction for those of our listeners who are not familiar with the EU. Uh, The EU has 27 member states and Germany is uh, the largest one. And so what the EU is doing is to bring and ultimately replace what Germany has been doing, bring the same type of rules to the entirety of the EU, uh, the EU's member states, to 27 member states. A directive, uh, to speak a bit more about how the EU adopts its own laws, 
A directive is a set of guidelines that the European Union gives to its member states. And then those guidelines need to be implemented by the 27 member states in their own binding piece of legislation. In practice, directives can be very prescriptive, which leaves little room uh, for maneuver to the member states. And, and, and I think this is what we should expect from uh, the directive. Um, the directive, uh, it's not hard law yet. We only have at this time a, a proposal by the European Commission that uh, was adopted and published a bit more than a year ago for a European directive uh, governing the due diligence of supply chains. And the Council of the EU, that's the 27 member states gathering and voting on uh, Commission proposals, uh, had its uh, own opinion uh, on the directive in autumn last year. Now the file is with the European Parliament, uh, which is currently discussing the, um, the, the text proposed by the Commission uh, in its various committees, and, and we are really, really in the middle of that, that, that process now. So we do not have yet a final text, but we know what uh, the Commission has proposed, we know what the Council has said, and we know what are the discussions and, and parts of those texts which are being debated by the Parliament. And this is what I'm going to, to present briefly to you now. And the, the directive essentially has three categories of uh, due diligence requirements. The first category is in the broader labor standards slash human rights bucket. Uh, and there is a list of a series of uh, international labor organization, ILO, uh, conventions, on a number of standards governing the labor standards that companies in the scope of the directive, and I'll get back to that in a minute, uh, have to uh, screen. So that's the first leg, labor standards and human rights. The second one is a series of uh, environmental standards the, that companies need to comply with, need to comply with and audit their uh, supply chain and value chains about. And a third leg is uh, climate change uh, and carbon footprint of the supply chain. And so these are three types of behaviors that companies are expected to do supply chain due diligence about. One important difference that I already uh, noticed with the German Act is which companies are in scope. So while this is not yet final, as I just explained, uh, the directive is under discussion right now, uh, the, the, the numbers that we have at this time are all large companies will be covered and large companies are more than 500 employees and a global turnover of uh, 150 million euro for the last financial year. That's for companies that are uh, based in Europe. Uh, a large company can also be a non-EU company that has uh, similarly 150 million euro of turnover, but in the EU. And then there is a lower tier of companies, which are uh, small or medium. Actually, I guess medium is better describing this threshold. With, uh, that's companies with 250 employees and a net worldwide turnover of more than uh, 40 million euro. Uh, that's for companies in the EU or companies outside of the EU that have this turnover in the EU. Those companies are required to do due diligence and um, without repeating too much what you said, I will briefly go through those obligations uh, for, in the directive. Essentially, you need to have a, a corporate policy on due diligence, and that policy needs to be directed at the, your own employees and your subsidiaries, uh, with a description on how the due diligence of the, um, the auditing of the supply chain is to be done. First thing, so a policy. Second thing is to identify in the supply chain and the value chain the uh, human rights and environmental impacts. So that's for the own operations, the operations of subsidiaries, as well as, well as the, all the company, the business relationships in the value chain. So that's having a policy. Second, identify the potential adverse and actual uh, adverse impacts of the uh, operations and supply and value chains. Then once the these risks have been identified, there needs to be a, a policy uh, to prevent and mitigate the potential adverse impact. And so a series of obligations there, I, I, won't, I won't review them in detail, um, but uh, quite prescriptive requirements to ensure that companies do, do audit their supply chain and prevent or mitigate potential uh, impacts. When uh, actual adverse impact has been identified in the supply chain, uh, then there's a series of obligations imposed on uh, companies in scope. 
uh, that include uh, concluding contracts with uh, indirect business partners, applying pressure on direct business uh, on, on existing uh, business partners to ensure that they gradually remove the uh, behavior that is problematic from an environmental or a human rights perspective. The directive explains that um, if the problem can be mitigated, there will be an obligation to suspend a commercial relationship while the problem is uh, being mitigated. If it can't be mitigated, a suspension is not enough and uh, adverse potential effects that are severe will require the termination of business relationships. And so that, that's an important feature of the, of the directive. Companies ultimately will be required to end and minimize adverse impacts, including by terminating existing uh, relationships. Importantly, there is a specific requirement to have complaint procedures where uh, stakeholders, and that's uh, specifically listed, you have trade unions, uh, NGOs, uh, anyone who has something to say about the potentially infringing behavior, needs to be able to complain and uh, specific requirement for the company to have a procedure to receive those complaints, address them, uh, and if there is an adverse impact identified, to remedy it. And so that's an important of the directive as well. And then there's a requirement to uh, monitor the effective method, effectiveness of all the policies and procedures that I have described, and to that's the last obligation, to publicly communicate uh, on the effectiveness of this due diligence. So these are a broad brush review of what are the obligations uh, of the directive. So I said the proposal is from uh, February of 2022, a bit more than a year ago. In the autumn, we had the council's position, now it's being discussed in the parliament. So uh, the expectation is that we have a final text in the course of this year. But obviously, uh, this uh, depends on how fast the parliament can adopt its position and then uh, how fast the parliament and the council agree on a common text which is the requirement to have uh, any piece of legislation adopted by the EU. So we expect it this year, uh, next year, at the latest. That's really interesting and shows that there are similar approaches in Germany and beyond. So uh, I heard that there is also another tax being prepared by the EU, the forced labour regulation. Can you just elaborate a bit more on that? And that's correct. So the forced labor regulation, as its name gives away, is about forced labor. So the, the, the scope of the behaviors that are in, uh, is uh, more narrow. Uh, it's not all labor standards. It's not environment. It's not carbon. It's simply identifying uh, forced labor. And it's not a directive. It's a regulation. And that is an important difference. I said earlier that directives are guidelines and that can be quite detailed, given to member states to adopt their own national legislations. Regulations are a, uh, a piece of legislation that is directly applicable throughout the European Union. So it's, uh, it's, it's equivalent to, a, to an act. And the forced labor regulation aims to target uh, imports of goods in which there could be forced labor. Uh, it's a bit, it's akin to the Uyghur Human Rights Protection Act that the U.S. has. Major difference is that it doesn't target any specific region, so it's any forced labor that is identified anywhere in the world. The major difference, I would say, with the directive is that while the directive is targeting large companies or medium uh, to large companies, the forced labor regulation will apply to goods imported by anyone. And so the triggering factor will be the placing of the good on the EU market. And that can be done by anyone. And so smaller companies will be impacted by uh, the forced labor regulation in ways that they, they will not be impacted uh, by, the, by the directive. In terms of the timing, in terms of the adoption of the regulation, the commission proposal came only in September of last year. And so we are roughly six months behind uh, in the negotiations uh, between the the negotiations of the adoption between the, the various EU institutions. We, we should not expect this this year, probably for, for next year. So, yeah, that's the, essentially uh, the forced labor regulation in NHL. Watch that space because while it covers fewer standards, uh, uh, only forced labor, uh, the impact uh, will be could be much bigger by, uh, by capturing entire flows of products. Imagine, uh, for instance, uh, silicon produced in Xinjiang or any other place on the face of the planet where there is evidence of forced labor, uh, 
uh, one this comes to the surface is notified to the competent authorities and who those competent authorities will be is not yet known it could be that there should be a big role for customs authorities plus a an agency in each member state once the forced labor situation is known uh, there there will be a, a fairly rapid fire sequence of event questions by by the authorities possibly customs tell me more about this consignment, let's say, of solar panels that you import from, let's say, Sri Lanka. I hear that I'm told that it could be including silicon from Xinjiang. Uh, please demonstrate that it's not the case because I have evidence on file that there is forced labor there. And the importing company will be required to collect and provide this type of information. And the inability to answer, as is often the case in customs investigation, then is trouble because customs will ask you to destroy the goods, for instance, which is the most likely scenario. Because I've not explained this yet, but the forced labor reg regulation, at least in the, the Commission's proposal version, applies to importation of goods, but also to the exportation. So if you are bringing something which has forced labor in it, you won't be able to take it out of the EU. And uh, so, some of the interesting questions we get, for instance, is what about a ship? That's the most extreme example that I've been able to, that I've received so far. But the question asked to us was, uh, what if I import a ship and there's allegation that it was made with forced labor so, in some place? Well, that, that's a problem because you have imported, uh, there, are, there are some suspensive procedures that uh, can apply, which won't amount to uh, an import of that ship. But if you end up not complying with them and there's forced labor, uh, the ship can't leave the EU territory. So just keep this on, on your radar, it's coming. Uh, it's a companion to the directive, and uh, it's going to require some serious supply chain uh, auditing uh, by anyone placing goods on the EU market as well. Thank you all for listening. I think it was a very interesting episode about the Supply Chain Act coming into force in Germany, but also in Europe, and also what we have to expect regarding a forced labor regulation. And I hope you enjoyed it, you learned something, and look forward to seeing, hearing something from you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Energy Explored is a Reed Smith production. Our producer is Ali McCardle. For more information about Reed Smith's energy and natural resources practice, please email energyexplored at reedsmith.com. You can find our podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and ReadSmith.com, and our social media accounts at ReadSmith LLP on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is provided for educational purposes. It does not constitute legal advice and is not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship, nor is it intended to suggest or establish standards of care applicable to particular lawyers in any given situation. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Any views, opinions, or comments made by any external guest speaker are not to be attributed to Reed Smith LLP or its individual lawyers. All rights reserved.